Okay, y'all, I am here with a new friend of mine, Ashton Moore. We connected over some random ask question I put in one of our YPO groups. I was like, I am planning a 50th birthday trip for my husband. Does anyone know someone in Peru? And you popped on the YPO chat and was like, I know the, what do you call him? The king of Peru? Yeah, the king of Peru or the prince of avocados, Javier Iwa. That's right. So I ended up connecting with him, but I loved our 15 minute chat. And so when I went down the rabbit hole of kind of like looking you up and all the things, there was something that you said that I absolutely loved. And I think I told you this when we first connected and I want to start this podcast with this. You said a question you asked people, not like, who are you? What do you do? And all that kind of shit. You say, what is the number one thing you can change in this world. And I thought that that was one of the greatest questions. I actually have kept that on a sticky note on my desk ever since hearing you ask that question, because I think that that is one of the coolest things to start a conversation with someone that you've never talked with before. So instead of introducing yourself, which we'll do in a second, but what is the number one thing that Ashton Moore has set out to change in this world? I would love for anybody to be able to build anything they can dream. Um, I call it simply democratizing entrepreneurship because the way the world is today, that's not the case. Um, People have either a lack of uh, a lack of access or a lack of resources or a lack of knowledge that they, um, they, they can probably uh, get there um, if they can solve for the first two. So I have recently heard that you have retired from your unbelievable career of life. And you're so young too. I heard on a podcast, you were born in 85, which makes you three years younger than me. So you're freaking really, really young. And you have decided to retire from your sales and marketing career to start a new business, I'm assuming, a new career path of helping people do probably solve that exact problem. Yeah. Well, so a marketer never retires. Um, you aren't necessarily born a marketer, but um, once you once you realize the power of building things that are magnetic, you never really stop. Um, but where I'm where I've shifted my focus is, um, you know, I've moved from um, and you know the the marketing companies that I've helped to create are are doing fantastic. You need a marketing referral. I've got you. They're like amazing uh, people, amazing leaders um, in those groups. And I'm still you know, active um, as they need me is what, how I like to think of it. Because my philosophy is that if you own equity in a company and you're not at least willing to keep an eye on it or be available if they call you, you should probably sell it. And so I'm, they all know, um, you know, I'm having coffee chats with uh, one of our leaders this afternoon, they all know I'm a Slack message away, but I am turning my attention to the capital markets and philanthropy uh, full time um, and the day to day. Cool. Something that you just said there was you never retire from doing that. How did you first get involved and how did you grow that skill? I'm assuming you think it's probably a skill to be a great marketer and a great salesperson. Yeah, well, I think it's about, I don't think it's more complicated than thinking about what people want um, and if it's, and figuring out how to communicate that you can solve for their need. Uh, Because I I see a lot of brilliant scientists uh, with incredible products who don't necessarily know how to communicate that you know they have a solution to x and marketing is the process of saying well if we have something that can help somebody how do we actually package it in such a way that that people understand that there's an option to have that solution in their lives it's interesting that you say that it's not that it's not that complicated because i feel like it's extremely complicated for a lot of people Well, I would say that a lot of people, um, a lot of people make the assumption that they're understood. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people forget that, um, you know, their target markets 
probably don't have a lot of time to pay attention to them. So, you know, that you'll see, you know, you'll see people running around saying, well, I have the solution. I have the solution. Um, you know, I, I, I can help, I can solve for this. But then when you look at their website, when you look at their bio, when you look at the way that they, they, they speak about what they do, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you don't do the deep work to make sure that you're appealing, um, to the people who you want to engage with, you know, you're going to end up burning a lot of time and all the wrong places, I think. Do you think a lot of people know exactly who they're talking to? No, absolutely not. No, most people like, I mean, if, if the question there is, hi, do you know who your target audience is? And hi, do you know what your unique selling proposition is? And if somebody can't tightly answer both of those, they haven't done the work in advance to figure out to whom they appeal to and, and why they're even in the room, which means that they're probably going to waste a bunch of people's time, which means they're probably going to waste a bunch of their own time. And then they're going to throw their arms up and say, marketing doesn't work. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah. It, well, it is. I mean, you know, forming the, the, so the group I'm a part of now is called Two Ravens Capital. And what we do is, um, you know, we, we buy companies, we become principals, um, and we help those companies to scale, grow, hockey stick, if it's a possibility. But, you know, in developing the company, you know, the, I spent the most time on um, not even worrying about how we were going to do it because there's always a way, but worrying about how we're going to appeal to our target markets. And, you know, because of that, you know, we have achieved a hundred million dollar pipeline in less than 30 days. Um, and I asked my, so my co-founder JD Morris has a lot more experience in the capital markets. He's deployed about $7 billion worth of, um, worth of special purpose vehicles, which is what we use to, to get involved with other companies. But I asked him, I go, Hey, is this normal? And he was like, absolutely not. He was like, this is not normal. Like, this is not, this is not how, when you come to market as a new, uh, as a new group, as a new investment firm or as a new capital firm, whatever you want to call it. He was like, yeah, this is, this is great. Kind of crazy. And I was like, good. That means the marketing worked. Yeah. It's so interesting. It, a silly story. It just reminds me of, I remember when my husband first bought into a group that owned racehorses. And when he first got in, like everyone chipped in, I don't know, $20,000 or whatever it is. That son of a bitch ended up winning like the first six or seven races. And so everyone just started piling in money to horse to horses. And it was like, guys, this is not normal. You hit the gold rush right off the bat. Right yeah. off the bat. So, yeah. Tell us a little bit about like how you kind of first got started on your entrepreneurial journey and how you kind of got into this marketing world. I've I've listened to a lot of podcasts that you've been on, so I know a little bit about your backstory, but I think it's super interesting. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. That's my I'm gonna put that compliment in my pocket. Um keep it with me all day. But um, you know, I kind of marketing, I've always been a creative. Like I I was um probably something you haven't heard on the other podcasts is um, I, I think I was maybe nine or 10 or 11 when uh, I was homeschooled. And so my mom would always look for extracurriculars, um, you know, to get involved with other kids. So I wasn't a weird antisocial, you know, homeschooled kid, like most of them. No, just kidding. You guys, I love and adore you. Um, but so she threw me into a 35 uh, millimeter black and white photography class. And I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, the, the, so from a very young age, I was capturing moments and learned how to develop, you know, the dark room process. And, you know, it didn't take much longer for me to st start, you know, the process, uh, if anybody remembers film cameras, <laughs> is that you would uh, snap the photo and it would transpose it onto a strip of film. And then you would use an enlarger to, um, you know, pass that on to um, the photo paper and then use a chemical process to develop it. Well, me being who I am as a person, it didn't take long for me to start smashing the negatives, leaving them out in the sun and seeing what kind of like grit and dirt and like other stuff you could create. 
like if you kind of went outside the margin, if you color it outside the lines and, you know, that's kind of the beginning. You know, I, I, you know, I'm a terrible artist, like a terrible artist with my hands, but I've always been into Photoshop, um, you know, uh, all the graphics programs. So, you know, these days I wouldn't, I would never hire me to develop a brand or a logo. I would go to my teams, but, um, you know, for, as a teenager, I was building websites, like co coding CSS, building like magazine covers for fun. And uh, I've, I've just really always been into the digital arts um, from, you know, starting with the black and white photography, moving on to the computers. And yeah, I just love creating things. It's so interesting because a lot of creatives have typically been the type of people who are, you know, they're either very creative or they're very much into business and it doesn't feel oftentimes it's, I feel like it's very rare that people who are very creative get so much involved in the business side. Is that true? I feel like that that's true. You know, the whole like starving artist, like stereotype. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I would, I would put starving artists. I would add the modifier uh, modifier, probably tortured. Um, you know, I'd say a lot of the greatest artists that have ever walked this earth, um, you know, the the Picassos, the Michelangelos, um, you know, they 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 often have a hard time grappling, communicating and working with the world the way it stands. Like there's something about it they see in a unique way that you know, maybe repels them from it, or it makes them feel like they don't belong, even though they do, and we love them. Um, so I think there's an element to that with that ability to see the world with a different sort of beauty that also means that maybe they don't quite get along with it the way that others do. That's a good way of putting it. I've never actually heard it. Like, kind of thought of as that, which makes a lot of sense. And it also gives people almost the permission to be okay with the way they are. So I know that that's a big part of who you are is, you know, obviously that first question that I asked you is like, how do you help the world? Like that is the one thing that you're a huge proponent of and something that you're extremely passionate about is helping the world and, you know, having a big part in blessing other people in order to be blessed. You know, I was looking at your Instagram and I noticed that like one of your quotes is that it's like basically super easy to be successful as long as you're helping people. So where did that whole like mission to try to like better the world and help the world and, you know, help yourself come from? Well, I guess to be vulnerable, um, I have a level of, um, like I, I I don't respond well when other people are like unhappy or uncomfortable or feel taken advantage of or like like it it really kind of impacts me too. So in a way, it's very selfish because like if somebody's get if somebody like needs help and they aren't getting it or if somebody um you know wants to create something and they don't have the ways or means like it like I feel that when they're close to me and so. Um, this kind of, you know, I've always been that way since a little kid. Um, like if I see, if I see somebody like, you know, and, and not in a good place, like I, I just, I feel that reflection very deeply and I go and it like, whatever they're feeling, I also feel. Um, and so I guess in some way helping people is my form of self-defense, um, <laughs> so that I can feel nice too. I mean, and it's the same in business. If I, like I have a rule that um, I very much believe in fair business dealings where nobody gets taken advantage of because some people like neg to negotiate in a way where they get the extra dollar. Like I like to negotiate in a way where not only uh, where both sides get what's fair and equal, but you think of a way to actually, you know, have a triple win for both people to get an extra dollar somehow, because there's always there's always a way if you're clever and creative uh, to, you know, have a one plus one equals three situation. That's so interesting. I've never I always feel like 
I mean, especially in the world that I think we live in now and the world that you deal with like hundreds of billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, I do feel like that is something that's super rare. How do you balance the thought process of one plus one equals three with the almost brutality and the of the business world because I don't see that very often. How do you how do you balance that? How do you feel like you can come to the table and always be thinking that way when most business doesn't kind of operate that way? Well, I think most uh, you know I think most of the let's use the word um, I think most of the negative impact uh, being created in the world um, and business is actually you know, forgotten and accidental as opposed to intentionally nefarious as, as my uh, approach and philosophy. I, I, I feel like it's very easy for a business to drift. And when a business drifts, somebody, you know, may not have checked to see if they're polluting the river recently, or somebody may not have checked in on their team to make sure that, you know, that they're getting a sufficient living wage or maybe inflation you know, jumped up and, you know, cost of goods went up and all of a sudden somebody's getting taken advantage of somewhere. I, I actually don't believe in almost all cases and note almost, 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 and almost all cases. I don't think that's on purpose. I, I think it, we, I think it's more of a, of a drift, which is why I, I go back to what I said earlier, where I say that, you know, if you own, a private equity, and I don't mean publicly traded stocks, those are different because they're regulated properly, um, I think. Um, I think so. But if you own like a private equity and and you don't care about it and you're not paying attention, you should probably sell it to somebody who does um, because they're going to look through, you know, all the corners and like check for cobwebs and say, hey, is is everybody here happy? Because my favorite thing about business is that I think that a great business improves the life of every stakeholder it touches, um, as opposed to taking from any specific stakeholder for the enrichment of the others. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast with my husband this weekend, and it was uh, a, around the lines of like fast food chains. My husband's a developer and we do, you know, we've worked with fast food chains before and we went and listened to a YPO or who is talking about this new um, coffee chain that has grown faster than any other chain right now. It's called seven brew coffee. They went from like a hundred location to 2000 locations in like two years. And one of the guys who was giving this presentation talked about the fact that like most big chains, let's talk about, you know, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, all of the big, big companies that are uh, like franchised and stuff. A lot of those founders have been generationally removed from the company. So it's become business again. So like when you lose the actual founder, the person who like actually started the company and why they started it and the passion that they had for it and watching over the employees and the quality and all of those things, they were talking about how basically a lot of restaurants nowadays are just about the bottom dollar and they don't care about their employees and they don't care about the quality and all of those things. How do we stop that from happening? Well, we get to vote with our dollar, which is the best part. Um, you know, I would encourage everybody to, um, and you know, the youngest generation does this as a matter of course, but I would encourage everybody to check the supply chain, you know, check the you know, uh, the what what does ESG mean? Everybody says that environmental, social, and corporate governance. Um, a set of considerations including environmental issues, social. Yeah. So, I mean, th I I would just say, you know, what do we do about it? Well, if all of our dollars are moving to the companies who care about the world, then the ones who don't will have to change. And yeah, that's not meant to take from those who are taking, but, um, you know, it's meant to simply show that, you know, we as a people won't stand for a world in which somebody is taking advantage of for the benefit of others. I, I, I would love to see this happen more and more often. I mean, I definitely think that we can, we can do it, but it definitely takes a collective voting with their dollars for sure. 
So you left your, so is Model B the main company that you started, the marketing yes. company? Okay. Yes. So Model B is amazing. Um, Model B is still amazing. Yes. Yes. How did you found that, by the way? So that was my, um, that was uh, founded after a decade of entrepreneurship of, uh, you know, I'd say a decade, my decade of entrepreneur uh, mediocrity, but, you know, that was, that mediocrity was a ser series of failures that taught me how to bounce higher and higher each time. And on my bounce, uh, let's see, eight or nine years ago, um, you know, I'd say my zero to one in entrepreneurship. And by the way, you don't have to suffer for a decade. Uh, we can talk more about coaching. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Fuck, please. And thank yes. you. Yes, we can talk. Let's talk about coaching before we end. But please. Um, so about eight years ago, I met uh, my co-founder of Model B, Aptin Bergari. Um, he kind of showed me the ropes of like proper business, like not just, you know, waffling and uh, fiddling, I think. Uh, he taught me how to produce instead of how to fiddle because uh, I've been fiddling because I didn't have coaching or didn't go through accelerators or didn't join the Entrepreneurs Organization Accelerator after when I hit 250K in revenue. Like I didn't do any of that. I just, my ego led me throughout my first decade of mediocrity and it never led me anywhere good because I figured I could do it myself. Yep. It happens yeah. so often. Why do you think you did that? Do you think it was strictly ego or what else? Was it just a hundred percent ego or was there something else that prevented you from asking for help or learning from others or learning that left will is a dumpster fire, but Look at I've gone right and it's worked out well. I I think it was a I think it was insecurity. I think I felt like I had to pretend that that I that I knew everything to get to be in the room. Um, one of my favorite moments, like when I founded my first company, I was twenty one years old. Um, I remember I was in. Uh, I showed up to pitch a, cl a prospective client on our services and, you know, they knocked on the door, they led me in, put me in the boardroom and I just sat and waited. And finally, like 12 minutes after we're supposed to get started, um, the uh, receptionist popped her head in and she goes, hey, is your boss coming? Like, it's, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I looked like a kid. So like, I get it, but yeah, they were, they assumed that I being 21 years old, you know, without a beard, uh, like I have today, I looked like a child. So I, you know, no, what no, was the company. Um, so my very first company was it services, uh, with, uh, with a healthy dash of like web support, uh, and design that I kind of was secondary to the it services, um, and I started that on accident because when I was 19 years old, when I was uh, cleaning carpets, bartending, catering, loading trucks, one of the catering companies saw that I was pretty good at computers. And they were like, hey, would you like a job doing computers? And I was like, well, what I, what I said on the outside was absolutely, that sounds like a great idea. And on the inside, well, I promptly called my older brother, Warner Moore, who runs a cybersecurity group now. And I was like, hi, I'm going to need you to teach me how to server um, what, like, what's a mail server? Like, what is all of this? But, you know, I read a lot of books. He helped a lot. Um, and you know, I did it well enough. I learned well enough to at least get to the point where they became my first client two years later. Cause I had other people asking for help too. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. I want you guys to actually hear that because I think it's really helpful. I, I think every entrepreneur, every business owner, everyone who's excelled in life has said, Oh, absolutely. I can do that. No problem. I remember one time when I was back in my golf career, I was hosting these clients and they asked me to do a speech afterwards to like basically MC the ceremony. And I had never really done that. Like I would doing the golf stuff and I'd done some television, but I'd never really done it. And I remember when they asked me like, but you can MC it after too. Right. And I was like, you bet I can. No problem. Absolutely. It'll be this be this be this be. And then I remember getting in the car going, what the fuck did I just sign up for? I mean, <laughs> but I feel like that I've had to do that. And I've witnessed my husband and his life and all of my clients. It's like, you just show up to that next level and that next version of yourself. I, I think, I think a lot of people think that everyone knows what they're doing. And unfortunately, I feel like 
no one actually knows what they're fucking doing. You just have to have the confidence and the self-trust to show up to do the thing, even if you actually have no fucking idea what you're doing. Yeah. And also be willing, and this is where I agree a thousand percent with all of that, but also be willing to recognize that if, that if you're an entrepreneur with an opportunity, there is somebody out there who can help you like, and you know, whether it's a coach to help guide you, you know, an accelerator or incubator to help teach you more fundamental things or a friend or a colleague who has a special skill that you have a need, you know, that, that, that you need for a project. Cause there are two kinds of uh, co-founders. There are technical founders and then there are business founders and the business founders are generally probably decent at sales and marketing. And often their superpower is they carve the way for those with high skill abilities to actually vend their wares and services. So like, you know, a rocket scientist who, you know, wouldn't march into, um, I don't know, one of Peter Thiel's funds and say, we need $20 million to build a rocket ship. Like that the rocket scientists would be in their garage trying to figure out how to build the rocket, like not thinking about the business case and not thinking about like, Hey, if we drum up enough tension, attention for this thing, we can probably raise some capital and build it at scale. How does a person understand in the beginning stages? And I don't know if that's, you know, I, I think that there's different stages of business. I think, Unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs just get into something because they're super passionate about it. And then all of a sudden it starts to grow. And then they're like, oh, fuck, I'm now a business owner. And I think that that's, you know, what happens to a lot of people who set out to either create something, sell something, solve a problem, whatever, whatever. And then they all of a sudden become a business owner. Where do you think, and tell me if you think that's true or not, but where do you think a person gets to where they're like, oh shit, I, I need to step into what I'm really good at and figure out how to insert people into what I'm not so good at. I think for, I'd encourage founders to start from day one to imagine themselves not as um, not not as the person doing the work, not as the CEO, not as the um, you know uh, executive chair, but rather as like a, an informal board advisor that oversees the board, who oversees the executive team, who oversees the manager, that oversees the high skill um, uh, teammates. Uh, because if you do that sort of thought process, what most founders do is they're good at something, and so they do it for people for money. Um, that's really just being like a super freelancer, uh, or a freelancer with a logo wrapped around their company, uh, which is totally fine. In fact, that's a great way to get started for no money. Like professional services groups don't need investors. Like they just need to, um, you know, do, you know, trade time for labor, but it's also a trap. Um, if you don't have a plan to scale outside of the trading time for labor, um, you know, to grow up and build a team of five people, um, you know, trading time for labor to hire to 15 with three managers to so on and so forth. And granted, you know, my first company was that it was time for labor. I share this uh, from deep experience. I promise this is not theory. What do you think is one of the biggest failures that you had that ended up being one of the biggest blessings? Hmm. Biggest fail. I, I mean, every company I've driven into the ground has been my best, mis like my best knowledge of how to not how many do companies that again. Has that been? I just want to like, I'm just curious because I think most people think someone that is, is success is who is as successful as you are and who has been in this game for such a long period of time and created the amount of revenue that you've created for multiple companies. I think a lot of people don't realize that you have driven a few companies into the ground. And I think it's important to say that. Yeah, I would say probably I, I've founded probably 20 companies that actually generated any revenue um, or a couple dollars. So I'd say I'd say around 20, give or take um, to, uh, about half of those. I've, I've sold, had two small exits and about half of those are still around. So I'd say, you know, if I were to guess, like five have probably either failed to launch or never gone 
anywhere. Um, so like a third of the ones that I've tried, but that that swing that's swinging over the years. Like these days, I won't even launch an LLC unless we have a line out the door. And I'm like, okay, like we have a lot. Like the last company I started, like we had a moment um, where we all looked around the room and we were like, we have like 10 or 20 or 30 K of like accounts receivable and we don't have an LLC or a bank account. I was like, great. It's time to start the LLC. <laughs> like let's where, where's my very first company? I registered the LLC and I was like, okay, where's the line? Like, oh where... my gosh. I think that is so funny to say. Cause I think that's so true in, in the, coaching space that I exist in, a lot of people do online courses and they spend tens of thousands of dollars or even thousands of dollars creating the course. And yet they've never sold one course and they don't have an audience to sell it to. And one thing that I've always said is like, you could literally have a course that cures cancer, but if no one knows that it exists and you have no one to sell it to, it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't fucking matter. You're exactly right. And that's you know, how to start a company. Here's my biggest marketing hack. Please my biggest share. Sales I'm hack. taking notes. Yeah, my number one, the, the one secret that they don't want you to know is um, if you spend all of your time like asking people what they want before you do anything else, you're going to build an incredible company that has... Uh, below average marketing costs, below average sales costs, and more and above average traction and above average customer satisfaction. Because instead of building something that you wanted, you you'll have built something that other people want. Asking your audience, asking yeah. your customer. Asking yeah, people think it's a like, customer. Yes. People think it's complicated, but it's actually just knocking on the door. One of my favorite founders, I'm a coach at the, or mentor, they call me, the Founder Institute, uh, the DC chapter. Uh, what's up, y'all? Um, and one of my favorite founders, um, he gets on like a weekly like office hours mentorship call. And he, I go, how are you doing? What's going on? He's like, oh, hey, I spent the entire weekend on... Uh, my university's campus interviewing people live about my potential product idea. I was just so proud. Like, and what happened? Um, well, he ended up realizing that nobody wanted it. So yeah. before he invested or raised money or invested more of his own time and his own resources into this build, he changed it like be to what other people want. And, you know, another way to uh, say it uh, is, I think this is a Brian Buffiniism, um, but it's, which means it's probably from Zig Ziglar. But it's um, <laughs> um, see a need, fill a need. I mean, and that's business. Like, but what's not business is um, just going off and building something. I mean, it was, um, I believe it was Edison who made a promise to himself at a very young age that he would never invent, try to invent or build something that didn't have commercial viability. And that's that. That's another way of saying, and to paraphrase that, he decided at a very young age not to build stuff that other people don't want. So I want everyone who's listening to this podcast who sells anything whatsoever or is creating something or wanting to create something, ask people. Ask people if they want it. Have people coming to you and saying, hey, how did you do this thing? Or, hey, what is this thing that you have? Because that's the best way to create business. Solve a freaking problem for someone else. Like, that's it. I Like how I started this whole business so many years ago was people were saying to me, how are you so confident? How have you be, been able to basically create your own life? How were you able to charge the money that you were able to charge in the beginning doing corporate golf events when other girls were doing them for free sitting in a fucking Southwest middle seat and you're getting paid $10,000 a day in first class, you know, flying all over the world. Like that's how this whole thing started. People were asking the question. So I provided what I believe to be the answer or what I hope to help people be the answer. But like, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to set out to do this thing and hope that people want it. Exactly, exactly, exactly right. I mean, that was, 
I mean, that's that, you know, when somebody says marketing doesn't work, um, do like people my, actually say that? <laughs> yes. Uh, all the time. Trust me. I tried marketing. It doesn't work for my business. Um, you know, I immediately, I mean, and, and like flashing lights go off in my head. And I'm like, okay, you probably don't know what you're selling to who. And you probably built it like based on a platform of ego. Like you might be one of 10 people in the entire world who want to buy the thing that you've made. Good job, buddy. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you would tell everyone, and I love doing tangibles. The first thing that you would tell everyone is go out and interview how many people? 100 people, 1,000 people, like what? Um, As many as you possibly can. Uh, but the number of people you have to interview is smaller if you're interviewing exactly the right person for who you want to build your product or your service for. So if it's, for example, CIOs of Fortune 500 companies and you have an idea for a B2B SaaS product that is specifically related to the manufacturing industry um, and you can get 10 interviews with those guys and gals, done. Great. Uh, the, it'll at least set you off in the right direction. If it's more on the consumer side, you know, multiply that by a power of 10. Uh, if it's B2C instead of B2B. Um, and also on the consumer side, you, you also want to check your assumptions to make sure that you are building the right thing for the right person. Well, I was about and to ask that question too. So one thing that I find that people kind of get nervous about is like getting too niched down, you know, in our space, people talk about a niche or whatever, but like I think so many people are so afraid to get so small, but it's so interesting. Once you kind of get super, super small, you're, you know, exactly who you're talking to. So what is your kind of tip for someone there? Like, how does someone figure out exactly who they're talking to? I would say that, uh, well, so two, two things there. So niching down and knowing who to talk to, knowing who to talk to is as simple as having the conversations. Um, yeah, it's it's very. Yeah, I'll take any conversation with anybody who reaches out to me cold and says they're trying to develop a product idea, um, and you know you're you're gonna get a few no's, but not very many. Uh, so you know, go on LinkedIn and reach out to people, or go to conferences. Like conferences are great because they're gonna be hundreds of people and your target audience to at least uh, validate your assumptions and you know how how do you know you're talking to the right person well if they get excited about what you're building and if they're not either your product's wrong or you're not building for them simple answer say well what do you want um i mean it's i, I even deploy i deploy this in everything like i was recently um antonio alec who's the king of whatsapp and ypo um, he recently bestowed upon me oh, moderation. I, I see his name all the time in our chats. He's amazing. He's an incredible human who gives back more than he's an inspiration for giving. What's his background? Uh, you know, I don't even know what he does. I just know that we, we run around and help with the WhatsApps and yeah. YPO. Yeah. Um, I should probably know that, but it, you know, <laughs> I'm going to ask him. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he bestowed upon me a new WhatsApp channel called YPO. So you know how they are, they're private to YPO members. Yeah. Um, but it's called YPO Act of Kindness. Oh, and, that's so cool. And we already have, uh, let's see here. It, it's already got 462 members in it. However, I am 100% sure nobody knows what's it for, what it's for. Uh -huh. So later, to, like, I've tried to like, I've, I've been trying different things. So uh, I've been like, oh, let's try quotes. Let's try. Let's see if people. So so I'm trying to figure out how to get people engaged and active. So later today, well, I'm add me in the group. I want to know what it's all about. Well, we don't know yet. So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to add you shortly. But what we don't know is what it's for. So later today. After I add you, I'm going to drop one of those little, hey, everybody, what's your name? What chapter of YPO are you in? Like one, two, three. Yeah. But question that there's going to be one big question, very simple question is like, hey, what's the number one thing you, you would love to get out of this group? And so instead of me trying to figure out like what the company, because I think communities are companies um, and companies are communities. 
not families. We can dive into that. Um, but um, I'm going to let them shape it. I'm going to do what they want. And then I'm going to make sure to adhere to the guidelines that they shape so that they get continued value from the thing that they've created that I get to be a part of as, as a leader. And I heard a great quote the other day that, that a leader, uh, the simple act of being a leader is helping other people get what they want. Mm. That's it. That is so good. A great leader is simply helping other people get what they want. Yeah. I like that, that quote. I, I love that. Can we talk about micro niching? Please. If you think you're too niched, dear founders, niche more. Um, and if you're not niched, I wish you good luck with love from Ashton. It is a dangerous place to not be niched in the world today, especially for businesses under $5 million. Like money is, is moving to AI. Money is moving to uh, globalized companies. I know I built a globalized AI powered company and I am moving money from other companies that previously uh, paid more dollars for the work that we do. Well, we do it for less money at the same high quality delivery because we use AI and, and, and we globalized. So uh, it's yeah. Micro niching is a beautiful way to become a dominant player and a single little tiny itty bitty segment and then expand to more. But if you try to boil the ocean from the other direction, it might, might take you 10 years to hit 5 mil in revenue. Hmm. I'm going to put myself out here very vulnerably and ask you a question that I want, you know, to answer kind of, if you can answer it. So I brand and market myself on a confidence coach who helps you step into your God-given purpose and make money doing it. That's how I brand myself in this online space. I'm going to assume that you think that that is not niched enough. Hey, well, you can niche more if, if you're looking, if you want to be more magnetic, um, the the exercise can i can i be prescriptive is that allowed please absolutely i just think that this like i'm willing to be like call my ass out because i think it'll help other people yeah so what i would do well so so again you don't it, the, like we make the worst decisions and, and you know i'll joke often like hey i need to lock myself in a room for an hour and just think but i don't actually do that i go and start talking to people like and so you know you have data right now where if you pulled every client you've ever had into a spreadsheet and then you catalog them by industry profession you know title there's something in there that's a common thread for probably 50 percent 51 percent of them and if you can find that golden thread and then just cut and paste it into your messaging on your the website headers into your thing you're going to attract three times as many of them um, and they're going to refer you uh, at three times faster because you've created yourself for them. Mm -hmm. I a hundred percent send testimonials. I a hundred percent send like Google spreadsheets or Google forums that say, help me get better. What was the one thing that you would say if you were to recommend me, what would it be? I have a spreadsheet of like 200 and I think it's probably up to 294. Um, basically like comments from all clients and things like that wow. yeah cool. i i definitely do that i know that that is like i just i try to use words that people have said about me in my marketing which i think i've told clients that for years that's super helpful you know use their language to them yeah well and and but not just that i mean uh, which is a uh, social proof is amazing. In fact, that's the best way to write your messaging is just repeating back the words uh, that they, that your customers say about you. So you're brilliant. And I think that that's super helpful. What you just said there too, because I think a lot of people get bored with saying the same thing over and over again. And I'm going to be the first person to say it is fucking boring, but it also works. Well, that, you know, you're, if you appeal to one audience and, you know, one example, um, you know, just to drive that home, by the way, is, you know, it might turn out that, you know, only a third of your clients are the same and everybody else is wildly different. And 
I would drill into that third. Like maybe a third of them are all CEOs. I would say I'm a confidence coach for CEOs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you'll just speed up. And then, you know, what will happen? What I always tell people and people never want to micro niche. They're like, all right, if I say that I only serve, um, you know, I, I use the example of B2B SaaS CIOs. Um, you know, if I say that I only serve those, and by the way, that's not niched enough, uh, you know, need B2B SaaS CIOs in um, uh, industrial manufacturing. Uh, that are doing know, 15 million plus. Yeah, doing 15 million in Latin America. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd be like, because if I were that person, I'd go, wow, you know me. Yeah. This is exactly who I've been looking for. Sales cycle shortens. I need to appear in front of them less times in order for them to engage. So my ad budget goes down. You know, all these amazing things happen when you build things like when you micro niche for a very specific industry. Once you dominate that space, you can go to a second one or build a new company because, wow, you're, you actually have a bit. Uh, you have money you can invest into another company. Whoa, cool. But again, if you're just if you're all things to all people, it's going to be a very it's not impossible it's just really hard. Yeah. I, this is so helpful too. I was just listening to a podcast on, um, uh, t uh tr I think his name is Troy Bowles. He's the founder of Raising Canes. Do you know who I'm talking about? He's a, he's a YPO -er. oh, uh, Cool. yeah, look up Raising Canes They're They've got, I think like eight or 900 locations. Tony Bowles. Is that his name? Troy Bowles. I don't know. I can't think of it at the moment. But I was just listening to a podcast on him on, it was fucking so good, but he talked, <laughs> it was, he sells four items. Raising Cane's sells four items and they're a billion dollar company. Wow. Chicken fingers, French fries, coleslaw, and t Texas toast. And everyone has told him for the last 20 something years of doing this business, you need to add salad. You need to add this. You need to add this. He's like, we do four things. We, they don't have ranch for crying out loud. Like I live in the Southern United States. People put ranch on fricking their breakfast. It doesn't, but he's no, we, we do one sauce, chicken, coleslaw, bread, and fries. That's all they do. And they are just so niche in everything they do. And it's, it's grown to be a billion dollar company. And I just think that that's a really good example of what you said, like be so niched down that like someone knows exactly who they're talking to. Well, exactly. And so, you know, there, there are also other ways. So I just want to share like, and, Please. uh, two Ravens, uh, capital, our new, um, investment group. Um, you know, I, I kind of didn't do that. Um, I did it a little different because we're pretty agnostic when it comes to industry. Like this year, we're looking for companies that are profitable and we would like to buy a piece of them and help them grow and work with the founders. And, but so, understanding that we're agnostic what i did instead is come up with a hook for the founders and you know i say you know, we're named two ravens capital after odin's ravens who would scour the world for opportunity so christina when we when we invest in you like we're going to become your ravens and we're going to like we're one away from the entire planet and we're going to think strategically about your number one partnerships, relationships, your top three, and we're going to put you in the room with them. And we're going to have a conversation about how we can partner together and 10 times. And the founders go, whoa, that's cool. And I go, it is. And by the way, here's an example. And I tell them about how we're working with a sensor company, this little itty bitty sensor company that has a very novel technology that a very, very big sensor company likely will be interested in. So we're walking them into the boardroom of very big sensor company because we're one away, like everybody. So we so we got close. We said, hey, do you want to take a look at little sensor company? And they said, absolutely. So we're walking them in. That's so freaking cool. And the whole mission behind it is because you want one to plus one to equal three. Exactly. And it will because... Um, so... When you um, deploy other people's capital to buy companies, you also you need to attract the founder on one side and you need to attract the funder on the other side. And in this world, a lot of our funders are 
you know, ultra high net worths, family offices, uh, those sorts of groups. So I'd uh, we had to come up with a way uh, to attract them as well. And so what we decided is that we would give five to twenty five percent of our profit um, in our group away to a worthy cause and the supply chain, because like I said, you know, a lot of companies, you know, there's probably something happening that could be better. And, and so, you know, I say, look, if you want to be in the news, like we deploy the give through our nonprofit that has a media arm that will get you in or out of the news. So if you want people to see that you're doing great stuff by working with us, We'll, we'll put you in there and we'll name you and we'll make sure the world knows that, for example, we're looking at a jeans company based in India that will likely move on. And I, ha I asked the founder what the number one issue in their supply chain is. And he shared that um, shared that the clothing sorting centers in India are powered by young Indian women who don't have health insurance because they can't afford it. So if we invest in this uh, jeans company, which is like 99.97%, um, I'm just raising capital for it. Uh, what we're going to do is give five to 25% of our profits away to buy health insurance for these women in the clothing sorting facilities. And the nonprofit will tend to that program to make sure that it's all deployed well. And, you know, that we have the right media messaging around it. But point is, is people love it on both sides, right? So, you know, again, it's more of an agnostic offering because we're not looking for a specific type of company and X industry Y thing. But being a marketer, I wanted to make sure that our offerings were compelling enough for people to talk about it. And people do. Ashton, I have just been, I'm so grateful that I put in that YPO chat, hey, has anyone been to Peru? And you're like, well, I know the king of avocado in Peru. Let me connect you with him. And you know what the funny part is? Is like, I talked to that guy for two seconds and I'm sure he's very nice man. Um, but I ended up connecting with another gentleman in YPO who's like the chairman this year or the president of the uh, Lima chapter. He's hooked me up. This is a surprise to my audience, but I am headed to uh, Menchu Picchu, the Selcante Trail in April with Nathan. So everything worked out. But the thing about it is, is I got to connect with you and you got to share your story and inspiration and for people now to go and follow you and follow your uh, new company and everything that's going to be happening. But I think you are a, um, I've been consuming your content a lot lately and you are extremely good at what you do. So if you guys are interested in all of the pieces that is Ashton Moore, where can they find you? Uh, just A-S-H-T-A-N Moore, M-O-O-R-E, basically everywhere. The Instagram and the LinkedIn and because yeah, I always like to tell people I will meet with literally anybody at least once for any reason. Uh, there's always a catch, which is you'll probably end up with homework. Um, but and that's a that's if you're seeking, you know, guidance or like experience or whatever. We could also just hang out and I can keep my mouth shut, which I don't mind at all. But um, yeah, I love meeting new people. And, and he uh, is telling the honest to God truth because when I put in that YPO group, I said. I'm looking for this help. And you immediately, we immediately set up a 15 minute call. You were sitting on a beach chair in Florida, I think it was. And it was literally a 15 minute call and we got to connect. And I'm super grateful that you said yes to this podcast. Thank you for doing so. This will not be the last time that we connect, I hope, because I'm very grateful and very excited for all that you have going on. And I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you back. Thank you so much for having me. It was so kind. You guys, please go follow him on all of the social media platforms, Instagram, LinkedIn, and is that it? Is that all you're at? I'm, I'm oh, do you do TikTok dances? This is no, what we need to know. No, 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 none of, well, I, I have, I have a TikTok, but I, I think I've only reposted something once. I, my, my favorite channel for like fun stuff is Instagram. And my I do. Favorite, I like your Instagram. Yeah. I think it's very good. Thanks. It's very, you guys, it, it's. It's smart, smart marketing. It's very, very good. You do a good job with it. And uh, I love, I always love looking at things and seeing the thing under the thing is what I call it. And you do the thing under the thing very well. 
Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. Anne Geibel and I, um, she's my photographer and I'm hers. We shoot each other once a quarter for the, the Instagrams. Um, but yeah, if you want to talk business, uh, just LinkedIn is best. Um, and Instagram is for fun. Uh, but you know, Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp. I don't know. I'm on most of the uh, Facebook. I have muted though. Don't use that one. I'm not a Facebook person myself. Anyway, I appreciate you so much. You guys, please go follow Ashton and share this episode because there were so many golden nuggets in it.